All right, well, it's now time to take a break from the main conversation and head over to my new favorite segment, Off the Grid. Uh, for those who can't read into that poor play on words, this segment is essentially my chance to get to ask some unconventional questions that might occasionally be borderline moronic, and well, hopefully, we learn something new about Mark in the process. All right, so my first question, Mark, are you tired of interviewers like me always asking you about the things that went wrong in your career? Uh, no, not really, because at the end of the day, I had a lot that went right. Um, so life's a little bit of a balance at all times. So if people want to talk about what went wrong and you can learn from it, fantastic, because every day is a school day. So, uh, yeah, I don't have a problem with that. All right. Okay, so in your time as a test driver, whenever you were faster than the actual Grand Prix drivers, how pissed were they usually? Um, yeah, they could get very pissed. I mean, actually, just talking about that, Senna got very pissed off with me one day when I uh, equaled his time in the active ride suspension car at, uh, at Imola when we were at McLaren. Because, again, I did a lot of active work there. Uh, to the point where he refused one of the McLaren personnel to take me to the airport because I was departing that day. It was kind of a little bit of a, uh, a psychological, you know, process from him to say, you know, you are the test guy and I'm the Grand Prix star. So, you know, I'll dictate what goes on here. And he did. They took note of it. So um, I had to find my own transportation to get to the airport. But, you know, that, that, that for me was just part of the makeup of what you had to absorb at that level. And, you know, I'd done my job and I'd done it well and uh, it had been noted. So that was that. But, yeah, uh, pressure's always on. Grand Prix drivers, you know, like any elite sports people, um, to a degree, you're always going to have a little bit of someone looking over your shoulder. So that's part of the pressures. People usually assume that F1 drivers live a life filled with glamour and gold rim sunglasses. Was this the image that was sold to you as a young kid? And in your experience, did that image hold true in real life? I think everybody looks at certain people in certain walks of life and they have some aspirational aspect of it. Don't get me wrong. I think Grand Prix Drive is very lucky, very fortunate, and we had a fantastic lifestyle. Uh, but, you know, a lot of that glam and glitz was exactly that. It was glam and glitz. A uh, long time on the road many occasions missing out on things. You know, I, I had a very young family, so <clears throat> I was already a father at uh, 21 years old and I was still trying to make my Grand Prix career. So for me, looking back, I missed out on a huge amount of my first son growing up because I was on the road. You know, you're on the road for some nine months of the year. So you missed out a lot of that side. That's not glam. That's not glitz. That's just an unfortunate scenario. But you have to make the choice and you have to go do what you need to do. Where we are today, my Grand Prix career enabled me to do certain things for my children that I ordinarily wouldn't have been able to do. So, you know, that's the sacrifice you make. But I think the travel element of it is something that is a little bit, a little bit more mundane than people expect, you know, very much uh, arrive at the circuit, go to the hotel, go back to the airport, get back on a plane again, same routine. You know, it might sound glam and glitz, but actually, uh, you know, it gets a little bit sort of old old habit and routine after a while. And I think that's part and parcel. Sometimes when people get burnt out, they get burnt out of that same routine. You know, that's interesting because I've spoken to quite a few, um, you know, race engineers and they, they kind of echo the same thing. You know, when you're in your early 20s, maybe traveling and going across the world is kind of a, it's, an, it's a nice thing. And then, but it gets old very quickly. Um, so it's nice to see that holds up with drivers as well. <laughs> Um, thanks to social media and you know various Netflix series like to drive like Drive to Survive, which a uh, new season just came out, uh, we can now see drivers' personalities on full display. Um, which current F one driver do you find most similar to yourself? You know, both in terms of personality and maybe career. Uh, that's a good one. Um, I haven't watched Drive to Survive. I've not watched any of the series, so I don't have any insight into that. But Probably Daniel Ricciardo. Really? I say that and because he's got he's got a good sense of humor and you know he he has a good laugh and he engages in, in every aspect of the of the team. But at the same time when he needs to go and get the job done, he does. Mm -hmm. And that was probably you know, if you talk to people 
probably from the outside looking in, many people would say, you know, I was you know, always cracking jokes or trying to keep things, you know, lighthearted because that's what I needed as an individual to sort of get on and do my job. And I think probably Daniel's made up in the same way. That's interesting. Well, like, because, I mean, again, this is a very broad brushstrokes thing, and I don't know yourself as well as you do, but uh, kind of looking in, I thought that maybe Nico Hulkenberg might be a good one because I thought, you know, he's another driver that um, maybe, I mean, and of course his career is not completely done yet, but had one or two, you know, he doesn't have any podiums yet. Maybe one or two things change that would be different right now. And if I'm remembering this correctly, he also did win at Le Mans, which I thought was maybe a nice similarity there. So, I mean, yeah. do you... I mean, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's an interesting one. If I look back, <clears throat> I mean, you, I don't know if you've ever done it, but if you if you look and see how many Grand Prix drivers have scored podium finishes, it's not that many. And when you look at it and you go, right, how many have scored two and then three, you know, the numbers start to reduce significantly. And there's, there's many Grand Prix drivers that you look on and you go like, right, what did they do? And actually, uh, many of them had never been on the podium. So, you know, it's quite an interesting uh, point. You look at a lot of careers and you, you go, oh, they've been around, but they've never been on the podium. So, you know, I, I still look from my side and I'm really happy that I managed to stand there on three occasions in cars that were not always fantastic. And also when I stood on the podiums, I stood against either world champions or world champions to be. So, you know, the, the, the quality and the caliber of the, the podiums I had, are good memories for me because uh, you know I had some great guys I stood alongside. Yeah, well, those are all really valid points, and yeah, you're right. I didn't really consider maybe the weight that even one podium might have. I think actually, maybe maybe I'm remembering this wrong, but your friend Martin Brundle, I don't think he ever stood on a podium. Is that correct? Or no, he had some, he, Martin had some podiums. Um, yeah, okay. yeah he, he had he had several podiums, so he would be up there. But, you know, it's, you could even look today and look in today's Grand Prix grid and, and, you know, analyze it. I mean, it'd be an interesting one for you to look at. But And then if you look over the last 10 years, 15 years, you know, the, you can do a spreadsheet. It's, it's, quite, it's quite an interesting thing. You know, several drivers' names that you will look at and actually, hmm, I never stood on the podium. It's, uh, it's quite a, a, a factual point to look at. Interesting. Well, that is the end of the off-the-grid segment, so time to go back to my main set of questions.